Hey y'all, welcome to week 13 of your first year of drum lessons, drum pad edition. My name is Penny Larson and I am super excited to have you with me today. We are in our fourth month of our first year of drum lessons. And things are picking up and things are only going to get more intense from here. So remember, even though I'm calling this your first year of drum lessons, we're going at a pretty intense pace. Okay. So if you find that it takes you more like two years to get through all of these lessons, that's totally cool. My goal with this project is that this is essentially a, a linear progression of lessons that you might have. Obviously, one of the cool things about personal private lessons is the curriculum gets to be very personalized. One of my favorite things about teaching is diagnosing what each student needs and and helping them to work on their weaknesses. These lessons are totally different from that, right? We are just plowing ahead with a fairly standardized curriculum. So if you're struggling to keep up, don't worry at all. As much as I'm doing new lessons every week, keeping up with this pace might be a lot, especially if you were legitimately starting from scratch when we started. Um, if you were using these lessons as a refresher, then keeping up with them might be perfect for you, right? So whatever you pace you need to go at, it's totally cool, right? Don't, don't feel bad. Um, and don't, don't get discouraged. Okay. So here we are beginning of our fourth month. Crazy, crazy. Um, we are going to do a new rudiment today. We're going to continue with our new snare solo raspberry march, and we're going to do a new warm up. This is a paradiddle pattern that's really simple. If I haven't made it clear yet, one of the things I like is shorter exercises, shorter physical patterns that that really work to build motions and and little motivic elements, right? Like little, you want to work the same motion a million times, right? And a lot of times that is best done with shorter exercises or, um, you know, licks that aren't even an exercise that just let you work on something over and over and over again in a really quick and really focused way. And I love long exercises too. They can be, they can be much more musical and in some ways a little bit more uh, artistically satisfying to play. But I am a super big fan of short exercises that are designed to just get something done, right? Get a physical move built up. This is an exercise uh, that I learned a long time ago. I forget exactly where I learned it. Um, like so many of these exercises, they're, you know, for lack of a better word, traditional or composed by anonymous. And, you know, I learned them from somebody and I'm teaching them from you to you. And I don't care if you credit me, right? There's, there's all these exercises floating around that we all kind of know and share. Um, but, so I didn't know what to call this. I'm calling it Paradiddles After America because it's a paradiddle pattern based on the accent pattern of the song America from West Side Story. Um, if you know that that piece, it goes dun 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 and so on. That's enough of bad melody for me. But the pattern is one two three one two three one two one two one two one two three one two three one two one two one two one two three one two three one two one two one two one two three one two three one two one two one two and so what we're gonna do is 
two paradiddle diddles for the one, two, three, one, two, three, and then three paradiddles for the one, two, one, two, one, two. Okay. And so that's going to give us six, four. Okay. So six quarter notes. The first three quarter notes, one and a half quarter notes is taken up with the first double paradiddle or sorry, paradiddle diddle. And then the next beat and a half is another paradiddle diddle. And then I have three beats taken up with three single paradiddles. So the first three beats are two paradiddle diddles, right? Because if each paradiddle diddle is six sixteenth notes or a beat and a half, right? One E and a two E is the first one. So then the second one is and a three E and a, eh? so now I've got four E and a five E and a six E and a, okay? I'm not even thinking about them that way though. I'm totally thinking paradiddle diddle, paradiddle diddle, paradiddle, 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 paradiddle diddle, paradiddle diddle, paradiddle, paradiddle, paradiddle. And if you notice, because I've got three, so the paradiddle diddles just keep repeating on the same hand, right? So I start the paradiddle diddle with the right hand and it keeps going. So the next one starts with the right hand as well. Because I've got three single paradiddles, how many, how many single paradiddles? Three. Okay, that's an odd number. I've got an even number of hands. So that means by the time I get to the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to have switched hands right? So right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, right. And now I'm going to do the pattern starting with my left hand. Okay. There's a million paradiddle exercises out there. Um, this is one of my favorite. We're actually going to talk about how to do this on the drum set on Friday because I love this exercise so much. Um, but let me play through it for you a couple different tempos just so you can see um, how it sounds. Like always, the more you can make your accents stand out, the more you'll be able to control your accent to non-accent ratio as you speed up. And in other settings, when you're playing things in a, you know, less kind of rigid rudimental way, in a more musical way, you'll be able to control how much louder than the non-accented notes the accented notes are. Okay, so, so let's do it nice and slow at first. So something like this. One, two, three, four, five, sixy, and uh. Okay, a little bit faster. One, two, three, four, five, six, Anna.
little faster still. One, two, three, four, five, six. little faster. One, two, three, four, five, six. And a little faster still. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so hopefully that is pretty self-explanatory. There's, um, there's a million ways that you can do paradiddle exercises like this. This is one of my favorites just because it works so well with this melody that I really love um, from West Side Story. Okay, so next... Let's talk about, last week we did the flam paradiddle because we've been doing so much with paradiddles. So this week we're going to take a step back and do the flam cue, which we skipped last time. The flam cue relies on the accent on the E, right? So up until now we've kind of thought of flams as being an accent, right? We sort of think of that high note just naturally as an accent. It's technically not, right? If you, if you look at rudiment number 20, the primary note isn't accented, right? So I can play flams down here. I can play flams the same volume as the other primary notes I'm playing. It's just that when we learn them, it's easier to keep them very separated. And a lot of the flam rudiments, most of them, have the flam as an accent. So we kind of get into this habit of thinking as the, the flam is an accent, just always. And it's not always, right? Um, it's really easy to think of patterns that are like, Where the flam, yeah, sure, the flams are sticking out and they're the accent. The flam cue is one of those special cases where the flam isn't the accent. The flam is there to thicken the non-accented notes and the accent is going to stand out clean and not thick. Okay, so if we're looking at the flam cue number 23 on our rudiment sheet, which, um, like all the sheets, will be available. There'll be a link in the doobly-doo. I've realized that I like saying doobly-doo way too much. Um, okay, so I'm going to play a flam, right? And I'm not going to accent the flam too much, right? I am going to have that, that note, the primary note, higher than the grace note, right? Because that's a flam. But I'm going to leave myself room for the E to be the accent. So, 
right? And then the last note is a flam as well. And likewise, I'm not going to have that be too loud, so that accent on E really stands out. Right, and it's that, that accent on E provides almost like a kick, right? And you can do these in a repeating fashion too. And getting that accent to stand out like that is what makes the flamicue just just this super funky, super cool rudiment, right? Right, that um, it's going to be super useful when we get over to the drum set too. That those offbeat sixteenth note accents are always going to give you something that is a little bit more uh, interesting. Funky is the word I want to come up with, but funky just seems so ethereal and ill-defined. Um, but when we put that accent on the E. It just really creates like a like a hiccup in the rhythm, right? So take your time and make sure that you give yourself time to get that accent up there. Right? And because, like I say, we've been thinking about the flams as the accents, this one is going to feel a little weird at first. Give yourself time to play those quiet flams. Right? And as you can see, there's a left-handed version too. So same thing. I'm going to play a low flame with my left hand and then the accent is with my right. So work on this at a tempo that makes sense to you. The, with like, like all the rudiments, r really like everything, right? Working on them slowly at first and making them as perfect as you can before you speed them up is the way to go. Y you know, the, we all want to go as fast as we can, right? So, so there's, there's a little bit of a, you know... Of course, you're going to try and go too fast because everybody does. We all do. But make sure that the bulk of the time you spend working on this is slower than you want to, slower than you think you should, and, and, and just as slow as you can convince yourself to go. I'm always amazed when I, when I tell students to slow things down. We really have to have a long discussion about just how slow that is. Um, most students really don't want to do things as slow as I do things when I work on them. And that, to me, that's telling, right? <laughs> just, just slow things down, make them perfect. It's about learning the motions. It's not about going fast at first. Okay, so that's the flame cue. Okay, lastly for today. We're going to do the, we're going to run through the second half of Raspberry March, which we started last time. Tomorrow, there will be a video of me um, playing through this on a snare drum for you so you can see how it sounds all together. Um, last week, we went over up until this quarter note here, right? We did the first three and a half lines. So we're going to pick up on the 
last measure of the fourth line, the mezzo forte. Okay, and we're just going to talk our way through again. And tomorrow is when you're going to get the real example of, okay, wait, so how does this all sound together? So from the mezzo forte, I've got an offbeat eighth note and then a couple eighth to sixteenth patterns and then a sixteenth rest and then E and a on beat four. So that measure sounds like this. One and two and a three and a four. E and a, right? One, two, three, four. Okay, that 16th rest, almost like the flamicue, gives us, gives us a note on the E that makes the pattern sound a little, gives us a little hiccup that sounds kind of funky, right? So now the first measure in line five, I've got a 16th rest, a 16th note, 16th rest, 16th note, 16th rest, 16th note, and then an eighth note. And of course, the middle one, the middle offbeat 16th note has an accent as well. So the pattern is like this. One E and a two E and, right? One E and a two E and. One, two, three, four. One E and a two E and. One E and a two E and. And the way I would stick this, normally I would do this sticking left, 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 right. But this feels more natural because of that accent if I play one E and a two E and, right? One E and a two E and, one E and a two E and, okay? And then I've got an accent on beat three into two sixteenths eighth pattern, three E and, and then four E and. So that whole measure sounds like this. One E and a two E and a three E and four E and. One E and a two E and a three E and four E and. Okay. The next measure, now eighth notes with accents, and I'm going to go back to my right hand lead sticking. So just right, left, right, left, right, left, right. One and two and three and four. One and two and three and four. And we've got a one bar repeat afterwards. So just like I just played it, you're going to do that twice in a row. One and two and three and four. One and two and three and four. Next measure, two eighths, four sixteenth notes, quarter note, four sixteenth notes. One and two e and a three, four e and a. So you can see, I hope, some of these measures are, the difficulty is like kind of a little intense. And then some of these measures, the difficulty is pretty moderate, right? And that's how most pieces of music are. There are going to be points where you really need to break out your abilities and points where you're going to be able to breathe. It's very, it's very unusual for a piece of music to be all super easy throughout or all ridiculously complex throughout. Um, of course, there are pieces of music that fulfill either of those extremes, but most music is somewhere in the middle, right? You're going to have stuff that isn't really challenging and you're like, okay, I got this section. And then there's going to be a section that you get to, and you're going to have to like really, really focus and make sure everything is going well. And then there's going to be a, a bit where you can breathe. And that's just, that's just the construction of music, right? It's music tends to be this up down flow. And a lot of times along with that goes like a difficulty flow, right? Where the music gets, more intense and less intense and, and expands and contracts. And a lot of times the difficulty will follow that as well. So first measure in line six is another one that I think isn't too, isn't too difficult. We've got quarter note, two eighths, an eighth rest, 
then four sixteenths and an eighth. The accent here is on the E after four. That is a little weird. So let's see how that sounds. I've got one, two, and three, and a four E and. Three and a four E and, right? Three and a four E and. Okay, and we're still mezzo forte. So I'm trying to play about that volume. So the accent, right, is about one step up. Let me do that measure one more time. First measure line six. One, two, and three, and a four E N. One, two, and three, and a four E N. Next measure, six sixteenths, an eighth, quarter, two eighths, accent on the end after four. One E and a two E and three. Four and one E and a two E and three. Four and that accent on the end after four leads into an accent on one on the next measure. Just eighths and quarters in this measure. One and two, three and four and one and two, three and four and. Next measure, I've got a sixteenth note and a dotted eighth. Remember a dotted note, it is worth one and a half times what it was worth originally. So an eighth note is normally worth two sixteenth notes. A dotted eighth is worth three sixteenth notes. So a sixteenth note and a dotted eighth note fills up one whole beat. So I've got one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and. Okay. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and. Right? So I've got sixteenth dotted eighth. 16th dotted eighth, 16th eighth, 16th, and then two sixteenths and an eighth. So one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and. Right, this is one of those ones that can look a little confusing, but once you hear how it sounds, Right, I mean it's a piece of cake, right? It just it flows really naturally musically. Looking at it on the looking at it on the page, it can be a little scary, especially with those dotted notes. Try not to be intimidated by how music looks on the page. Music on the page is there so you can figure out how it sounds. And then once you hear how it sounds, making it sound that way, once you hear how it sounds in your head, whether it's you know listening to me play it or reading the music and using your inner ear. Once you know how it sounds, making it sound that way is what making music is, right? That's why we use written music. That's why we have lessons where people demonstrate stuff because the goal is for you to make the sounds that you want to make, right? Whether it's written on a page or playing along with a song, right? But so try not to be too intimidated when you see something on the page and a you know, looks really scary. There's all those broken beams with the sixteenths and eighths and stuff. Work your way through it and hear how it sounds and then worry about speeding it up. Okay. So the first measure in line seven starts out with a quarter rest, quarter note, dotted eighth, sixteenth, two sixteenths and an eighth. One, two, three, a four and. One, two, Three, a four and one, two, three, a four and. Pretty easy. Next measure, super simple, all right? One and two, three, four. One and two, three, four. The next measure, we have a half note. Remember, we don't see half notes too much on drums because they just, they're so long, we usually don't use them. Drums as an instrument sound so short, right? Drums are a self-decaying instrument, right? You hit it, and whether it's a whole note or a 64th note, right? It's going to sound the same with no alteration to the note. So we don't use half notes too much, but remember a half note is worth two beats, two whole beats, okay? So 
The third measure in line seven is one, two, three, four, and, all right? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and, all right? Okay, so last measure in line seven. Now I've finally got a dynamic change. The first note is still at that mezzo forte, the quarter note on one, one, but I'm gonna go to piano on the and after two. So I get one, two, and three, and four, Iana. One, two, and three, and four, Iana. And remember, piano is our quietest dynamic in this piece. So you can make your quiet pretty quiet because you don't need to go, you don't need another volume to go under it. So you can play pretty quietly for, for your piano. If we had two P's anywhere, if we had a pianissimo, we would want to leave ourselves some room, but because we were only going down to piano, we can go pretty quiet. Dynamics are all relative. Um, I would engage in an argument about there being um, universal dynamics, but I think I would win. <laughs> um, Within each piece of music, you know, whether, whether you're forte or fortissimo or mezzo forte or piano or pianissimo or pianissimo, right? Or any of those levels, those are all gonna be relative to everything else that's going on. Um, they're gonna be relative to what instrument you're playing. They're gonna be relative to, if I'm playing outside, my forte is different than if I'm playing in a small room, right? So, um, so you have some room for interpretation. And in a piece where piano is your quietest dynamic level, I'm arguing that you have room to make that pretty quiet. Okay, so now we're at the first measure of the eighth line. The eighth line is our big finish, right? So I'm starting quiet. I've got four sixteenths and an eighth, four sixteenths and three eighths. Right, so that sounds like one E and a two and a three E and four and. One E and a two and a three E and four and. We've seen this before, but remember when you have an eighth and two sixteenths and then two sixteenths and an eighth, those sixteenth notes in the middle work like a group of four sixteenth notes, right? So if four sixteenth notes on a beat, one e and a, right? If I start those on and, and a three e and, right? I still get that da 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 da. One e and a two, and a three e and, right? The it's it's the same thing physically, and it kind of functions the same. We're just starting it in a different spot, okay? So that measure again, one e and a two, and a three e and four and. One E and a two and a three E and four and. The next measure, almost full of eighth notes with an eighth rest on two. One and two and three and four and. One and two and three and four and. Here we've got the start, in the middle of this measure, we've got the start of another hairpin, right? Which is a crescendo, right? We talked about last time. So we're gonna gradually get louder. I'm starting at piano. That whole two and a half measures to the very last note where it's fortissimo, I'm gonna get louder little by little, okay? So the third measure in the eighth line has another one of those eighth, two sixteen, two sixteen, eighth things. And actually, we've got one at the end of this measure too that leads into the next measure so what ends up happening in these two measures, let's talk really, really briefly about this. So in the third and fourth measures in line eight, I've got this repeating pattern that is eighth note, four sixteenths, 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 eighth note to the last quarter note. Okay, so this pattern happens one, two, three, four, five times 
and it kind of rolls over the beat, right? One and a two e and three e and a four and a one e and two e and a three and a four e and one. Okay, I didn't do the crescendo there just so you can see the counting. One and a two e and three e and a four and a one e and two e and a three and a four e and one. Right? So now without the counting, Right, see how it just it creates this rolling and it's every other time it's off the beat. Right? So you really have to pay attention to where the beat is, or it's very easy to get lost. Let's try that with the with a bit of crescendo too. So one and a two e and three and a four and a one e and two e and a three and a four e and one. One and a two e and three and a four and a one e and two e and a three and a four e and one. Right? And that last note where it's an accent at fortissimo, you really, you can feel free to really smack that accent, right? And then rests for the rest of the measure. Um, okay, so try and put this whole thing together. Um, Next week in our lessons, I'll probably play through this for you, but on the pad. But again, tomorrow, um, I'll put up a video of me playing this on a snare drum so you can see how it actually sounds as a piece of music and not just a bunch of measures put together on a drum pad. Okay, so that's gonna do it for today. Um, we've got our new paradiddle warm up exercise. We've got our new rudiment, the flame cue, and we've finished up kind of working our way through Raspberry March. Um, definitely, especially with something like Raspberry March, if you have any questions, please leave them below. Um, I I am uh, I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to to showing you the paradiddle exercise on the drum set on Friday. And I'm really happy that I seem to be fully recovered. I really appreciate those of you that have sent well wishes along. Um, I hope that you all are keeping safe and keeping sane and happy and positive. Um, things are really interesting right now. And um, for some people, it is providing them lots of time to get lots of work done and be very productive. And for some people, it's providing um, a lot of stress and a lot of fear and a lot of uncertainty. And um, whether you are being super productive and all hardcore and yay, I have lots of time to work on things I never have time to work on, or you are just working to get through this and not drive yourself crazy with stress and worry and anxiety, either of those is totally valid, okay? If, if you come out of lockdown with three new albums written and recorded, awesome, bully for you. And if you come out of lockdown um, having gained 15 pounds, not really done much productive, but with a smile on your face, Bully for you too, okay? Um, these are crazy times and however you get through them, you get through them. Um, honestly, it's a little, it's been a little bit of both for me, right? Cause, cause I haven't, I wasn't feeling well for a while. Um, but now that I'm feeling better, I'm kind of having um, days that are productive and days that are less productive. Um, so, <laughs> so, um, that's an okay path to, all right. So I will see y'all on Friday. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. It would be great if you subscribe to the channel. So you are kept aware of when I put out new videos. If you are really excited about my content, you can hit the little notification bell and then you will get a notification when I release new videos. Um, you can 
find me on Facebook and Instagram at Penny Larson Drums, and I'd be very happy to connect with you there. And until Friday, that's going to do it. So again, I hope you all are are happy and safe and staying sane and being as productive as you can or want and being as happy and unstressed as you can. Um, all right. I will see you all again very soon. I love you guys very much. Take care. Bye.